It was in 1978. Uh, I had been serving in ministry now for a lot, about five years. And I had come to a place where even though I had been doing a lot of good things for God, as a matter of fact, I preached my first sermon in June of 1976. I, I was five years old. Sister Margaret came up to me this morning and said, oh, good, you're preaching the, the funny old man. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I preached my first sermon in 1976. And God was using me in a number of different ways that was beyond my ability and especially beyond my past. As some of you know, you know my testimony a little bit. I grew up, unfortunately, in the home of domestic abuse. I saw my father beat up my mother at age six and in the arms of another woman at age seven. I grew up in a place called Woodlawn. Hope none of you all know where Woodlawn is. Otis knows where Woodlawn is because he was one of the bad guys I was running away from in, in Woodlawn. There he is right over there. I'm going to point him out right there. <laughs> his, his mother, Dorothy's husband, somehow Jesus saved him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> so I grew up in an environment, to be very honest with you, that should have seen me in one of two types of settings, either in prison or in a cemetery. So when Jesus saved me, I mean, I really got saved, y'all. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't like a religious kind of thing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I mean, I knew how bad I was, and I knew how good Jesus was. Yeah. So I launched out in the ministry. I shared the gospel with everybody that would, would talk with me, and I even shared the gospel with folk that didn't want to talk to me. I didn't care. First two years that I became a believer, over 200 people came to know Christ through my personal testimony of Jesus Christ. I was on fire for God. But in 1978, in the midst of all of what was going on, I had reached a low point. Matter of fact, no, I'm sorry, it was 1977, 76, whenever. I had reached a low point. I was doing all these things out here, but there was something missing still in here. Now, I read the Bible every day back then, y'all. I'm talking about I read the Bible. As a matter of fact, they didn't have all these fancy new versions we got now. I read the King James Version. Can y'all believe that? I know there's a Holy Spirit. If I can understand those these and thou's, praise the Lord. But in spite of all of that, I began to feel far away from God. In spite of all of that, I began to sense in my soul a restlessness. Now, it wasn't the same type of restlessness that I had experienced when I did not know Jesus. But there was an emptiness that was there, even though I was busy for Jesus. See, I had become like Martha, a person who was so busy with life and even busy with serving God that I forgot who I was serving. We're in the midst of a series of messages called Intimacy with God, falling deeper and deeper in love with Jesus. After being in the ministry now, going on 45 years, or whatever it is, I can't remember, whatever. Y'all don't need to know that. I've come to the conclusion how it's so easy to fall into the trap of choosing a good thing, a relationship with a guy. Y'all got quiet on that one. A relationship with a gal. Y'all got quiet on that one. 
a job that pays six figures. My first job paid six figures minus the six figures. Praise the Lord. You remember that said <laughs> um, Our first year in full-time ministry, I made $6,413. I'll never forget that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We paid $2,400 for a two-bedroom apartment. I think y'all know this. We shared it with one of the people that worked with me, plus some roaches and some rats. We had a lot of fellowship in that apartment. $1,500 for a health care plan, and we lived on the rest. It, uh, but w whatever. Even doing church work, but losing the focus of why we are doing what we're doing. It's called being religious. It's called being self-righteous. It's called being, you think you are Mr. or Mrs. Big Stuff. <laughs> now, if you're not 50 or older or 60 or older, oldest, they don't know what I'm talking about when I did that, okay? Mr. Big Stuff, who do you, whatever, okay. <laughs> See, they, they don't know what's going on here. <laughs> D, you do not know that song, girl. Oh, Lord, save her, Jesus. <laughs> this morning, I want to talk about a message that I've been titled, Are You a Martha or a Mary? Are you a Martha or a Mary? Father, help us, Lord, now as we share your word with your people. Move us out the way. Allow your Holy Spirit to be front and center. We love you and we certainly need you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The text that we're going to be studying this morning reads as follows. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village. You know, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now, I'm sure if, if you've been in church more than five minutes, you've probably heard a preacher preach on this text. Uh, I teach preaching at North Park Seminary, and one of the things that bothers me to no end is when I hear preachers preach a text out of context, because whether they realize it or not, they just preach pretext. Y'all get that at 2 o'clock. Don't worry about it. Let me say it again. If you preach a text out of context, be careful lest you preach pretext. Did y'all get that? Y'all can say amen if you got it. Y'all can say I'm confused, Dr. Perry, but you'll get it at 2 o'clock. Don't worry about it. Because I have heard all kind of preachers denigrate Martha. They said, mm, you don't want to be like that girl, Martha. She ain't right. Look at her. She got a problem. She remind me of my sister. <laughs> and they fail to understand that within that particular first century Jewish context, a woman's honor and significance was directly related to her hospitality and service. Hmm, took it out of context. Took it out of context. So Martha was not that complaining old woman or young woman, amen? Martha, believe it or not, was looking out for her sister. She was saying, girl, don't you know how rumors get spread in this community in Bethany? If they find out 
that Jesus came here and you were sitting down on the job, we would never be able to live that down. Points to me this very important fact. You can have the right motive, but still be doing the wrong thing. Mm, come on now, preacher. It's getting, mm. Martha had the right motive in her context, but unfortunately, she was doing the wrong thing because she failed to understand that no matter how good something else is, it's not good enough than Jesus. No matter how good that job is, it's not worth putting that job over Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? No matter how good that that young man is. Oh, he is so sweet. He is so. Y'all don't say these words anymore because that y'all too young, but he's so fine. <laughs> Ooh. He is not worth. I got an amen on that one, didn't I? <laughs> he is not worth. More than Jesus. See, Martha, just like many of us, fell into this trap. And here's my main idea for this particular sermon. She began to get so distracted with the busyness of life that she chose a good thing instead of the best, Jesus. Now, I don't know what your testimony is. I know what mine is. I used to love me some Boone's Farm. over there acting holier than thou <laughs> on, on, on the organ. I would have come to George, but he's too far away. But George's too young for Boone's Farm. He don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, I used to love me some Boone's Farm, y'all. That stuff was so sweet. Bruce, now you messing up, Bruce. Hold on one second with me. Whatever the demon of the audiovisual needs to go away right now. What's going on? Can you turn it off. I'm still getting this buzz. In, in that somehow the devil gets right in the middle of a good joke. <laughs> or oh, oh, oh maybe that was the Holy Spirit since I was talking about Boone's Farm. Let me give you three little insights from this text that will keep you and I away from choosing a good thing instead of the best thing. Number one, what's the first insight that we can learn from Martha and Mary that will help us to continue to put Jesus as the center of our hearts no matter what? Quite simply this, we are able to keep Jesus as the center of our heart and choose him above all else when we learn how to listen carefully to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Look at the text. Look at the text. It says this, I know that I'm choosing good and not the best when my motive is to simply please and listen to the voice of people. Did you hear that, church? Instead of listening to the voice of God, the text reads as follows. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a certain a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. In my Bible, New American Standard that I have, it says with her much service. That word distracted from the original text 
can, tip, can be defined as something specifically that is used to draw a person away in different directions at the same time. The Greek text helps us understand it has a particular emphasis, specifically as it relates to the cares and responsibilities of this world. It's in the imperfect tense. You all, you all don't need to know all about that. All you need to know is this, is that that verb in the original language simply means that not only was she drawn away, she was drawn away continually. In other words, Martha had ADD as it relates to Jesus. Now, I'm not putting that down. Don't worry about that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm using it as an illustration. Martha was the kind of person who loved Jesus, but because she didn't understand how the devil doesn't come to you in evil, he comes to you in good, she continued to be distracted from the best. Did you hear what I said? When I was out there drinking Boone's Farm, the devil came to me in evil. But when Jesus saved me and I started reading his word, start preaching and serving, he, don't, he can't trick me up with no Boone's Farm anymore. I haven't had a drop of booze from in 45 years or whatever. Me and my wife just came from a cruise. You know, on cruises, they make their money from all the liquor you buy. You know that, don't you? And gambling. You know that, don't you? They hate us. <laughs> when the Lord delivered me, he delivered me from that. But you know what? He didn't deliver me from some other stuff. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And most of that stuff don't look evil. It looks Good. I remember one time I was preaching, and this gal in the pulpit was flirting with me. I'm serious. I, I ain't making it up. Saved, sanctified. Might have had a white dress on that day. I don't know. When I was pastoring in Chicago, I, 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 in our church, I, I'm only going to be preaching 40 minutes this morning. I, I would, because I was a senior pastor then, I preached about an hour and 10, hour and 15 minutes every Sunday. And it was the word. And afterwards, the people would greet me in the back. And, you know, we had a, a growing church, and they come back there, and, uh, you know, and the young gals say, Oh, you're so wonderful. Oh, you're so wonderful, Pastor. All of a sudden, I clipped the sky, my wife started standing next to me. She said, yeah, and I'm Mrs. Wonderful. But that's a whole different story. <laughs> the subtlety of the enemy, listen carefully, listen carefully, listen carefully, is that he doesn't come to you, if you've been saved for a little while, with some obnoxious bad stuff. He gets you to be pulled away from Jesus with some good stuff. Oh, baby, I got to work these 70 hours a week because, you know, we got to make this money so I can get that Mercedes. Oh, 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 no, 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 I, I'm sorry. I, we don't have time to spend time with Jesus because, you know, we got to do this. We got to do that. We got we to we, we, we gotta build something. Oh, no, 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 no. I can't. I don't have time to worship Jesus because I got to get ready for choir practice. Or even preaching a sermon. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Somebody better say amen up in this church. I only got 20 more minutes, praise the Lord. It is not the evil you have to be aware of and warned of more than the good that's disguised and that will pull you away from the best, which is Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Listen to this old man now. Let me say it again. It is not the evil that you have to be on guard from most. It's the good that has been disguised to pull you away from the best that is Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Some of you are saying, Dr. Perry, how, how do I listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit? Let me give you three little quick Three little quick ways that will help you. Number one, inside number one, under listening carefully, find the right time for you. 
Stop making excuses. You don't have to do it early in the morning. Like, I, you know, I'm an early person. You know, I get up early. Some of y'all know. Some of y'all say, why in the world is he texting so early in the morning? Well, I'm old now. You ought to be glad you didn't know me 20 years ago when I'd be calling you at 6 a.m. in the morning. Praise the Lord. Did you do this? I don't know. <laughs> Find the right space for you. What does that mean? Worshiping God, you don't have to just do it in a church or a church. You can do it anywhere, whatever is comfortable for you. Find the right way for you. Some of you need to put on some gospel music. Some of you need to read from the text. For Some of you need to dance. Whatever you do to have intimacy with God, do that. And don't let anything pull you away from that. Even religious things. Some of you are running on fumes. You haven't heard the voice of Jesus in 10 years. And you wonder why your life is so raggedy on the inside. And you wonder why every little thing that comes the devil before you, you get tempted by. You can chant, you can do yoga, and I'm not putting all this stuff down. You can listen to Oprah. I love Oprah. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not hating on Oprah. But positive thinking ain't going to get you out of the clutches of the enemy. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You can positive think all you want. Only the voice of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God convicting and changing your soul will help you to be who God wants you to be. First little way that you and I can choose the good instead of the best, choose the best instead of the good, is to listen carefully. Secondly, we secondly can choose the best instead of the good when we put intentional guardrails around non-negotiable areas of our life. Walking with God is hard, y'all. I get so sick and tired. See, I can say this. I'm an old person, and I won't even remember half the stuff I said, so, you know, praise the Lord. I get so sick and tired of these Christians that want the Christian life to be easy. They, they, want, they just want the Christian life to be a gravy train. They don't want to do nothing. They just want to show up. And say, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> the Christian life ain't easy, y'all. Man, when I was out there drinking that booze from, everything was easy. I'm serious. I was doing good in football. I was doing... I wasn't doing good in relationship, but according to the world, I was. I mean, it was easy. But the moment I got saved, it got hard. I couldn't do some stuff I used to be able to do. I couldn't go some places I, I, I used to be able to go, Brother Melvin. I saw you at those places, though. No, I'm older than you, but no, I didn't see you there. So. I'm getting you in trouble with your wife, ain't it? <laughs> he ain't going to never sit there again when I preach. I'm there. <laughs> See, George, you're next. I'm coming for you. There are four areas that you need to intentionally do some work in in order to continue to choose the best instead of the good. First is your relationship with God. You know, we have, we've got a class coming up here. I, some of you all know that I retired a couple years ago, and I'm the only person that retired to two jobs. Figure that out. <laughs> Pray for me. So one of the jobs I have, which I love, is being the executive pastor of this church. I love that job. I love Found the Life. You all my, are, now this is what my grandson would say, so I don't know if I'm going to say it the right way. You all are my peeps. Did I say that right? D, did I say that right? D helps me to stay relevant. She's a, she helps me. To, that, Dr. Perry, you shouldn't have said that. Okay. You all are my peeps. But I got a second job. 
I, I'm the academic dean and professor of preaching at North Park Seminary. We got a seminary class that some of you all been hearing and just going past you, and you say, well, it ain't for me. Why not? What well, costs some money? Well, stuff that's worth something does cost something. My relationship with God. Secondly, my relationship with myself. Now, notice the order I have this in. I did that intentionally. Because some of us think it's bad to take care of ourselves. That's unbiblical thinking. You put whatever you want to put in your body and die at 45 from a heart attack, you're going to wonder, what happened? This past Wednesday, I, I went to pray with one of my relatives just found out that she was very sick. Didn't realize it. I got the Holy Spirit said, you better go and pray with her now. She lives in the far south suburbs of, of Chicago. I, I drove an hour or whatever that was out there. I prayed with her. She was moaning. She, I, I know the Spirit touched her. I know that my words might not have. She died at four something of that next morning. Just turned 50. That's a young person to me. You, you can make all the excuses you want about not exercising. You can make all the excuses you want about not resting, about not taking a vacation. I work hard, but I take my summer vacation, y'all. I do. You need to treat yourself as the temple of God because that's who you are. Stop making excuses. Thirdly, put some guardrails around those closest to you. Whether you're married or not, it doesn't matter. Relationships are important. I'm 60-something years old now. In other words, I'm pretty close to the grave. And I know some of y'all love me up here in Fountain Light, but when I get to that place, I ain't going to see y'all. Y'all will come to the funeral, but you ain't going to be coming when I'm slobbering over myself at the bed. I know y'all ain't going to. Well, Brittany will. She's my daughter, too. But, you know, but, but nobody else will. Brittany will make her way. Dad, are you okay? <laughs> Sing to me, Brittany. Do something, girl. Guard those relationships. Do you have bad relationships with your brothers or sisters or mother or father or or? or spouse or whatever, guard that. Do you know that that, that that is pulling you away from being able to love Jesus? Did you know that? Did you know that? I'm serious. Listen to me now. Listen to the old man. That's pulling you away from giving your heart totally to Jesus because of the hurt and the bitterness and whatever else is inside of you that's blocking those relationships. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Get it right. Forget about whose fault it was. Get that stuff up. If I had to be worried about that, I wouldn't be talking to half of y'all in here, but that's all this story. Praise the Lord. Fourthly, put some guardrails around God's kingdom agenda for your life. God didn't just put you on earth to work a job, to get a house, to make some money, to go put some money in the bank. God has a kingdom agenda for you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Maybe you're not called to be a preacher like I am or a, a, a person who, who teaches preachers, but uh, God has a call on your life. He's given you spiritual gifts. He's given you spiritual insight. He wants you to be used by God. He don't want you to just be coming and sitting in some place. And that's your service to God. He wants you to be used by God to the glory of God. Some of y'all need to stop sitting. I'm getting tired of hearing, seeing these announcements about all the things we need around here. I'm getting tired of that. Working our worship team to death. Working these musicians to death. I know the stuff. Working them to death.
Look at the text. Look at the text. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen. You, you see that in the text? Has chosen the good part. That word in the original language simply means to choose. However, it does not necessarily imply the rejection of what is not chosen, but gives favor to the chosen subject. Now, let me help you understand this real quickly. I'm not going to go into Greek language here, but let me help you. What it's saying is, is it's not wrong to work. It's not wrong to serve. It's not wrong to love someone. That's, that's what, but it's just saying, if you do that more than you love Jesus, that's where it's wrong. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? Do you understand what I just said? Don't, don't, don't come away with saying, well, you know, Dr. Perry said it's wrong with me not to work, so tomorrow I'm going to go to my job and tell my boss, I can't work. Dr. Perry said I can't work after I have to read my Bible. And, uh, that's what he said. Uh, no, you didn't hear what I, you didn't hear that. The arrow's tense in the Greek text is very important. It's a one-time action that takes place in the past. How does that relate to this particular word, chosen? In other words, Mary put her foot in the ground and said, I'm going to stop making excuses from this point on. I'm going to love Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. See, unlike the imperfect tense that's continuous, the arrow's tense is once. I did it in the past. I ain't doing it no more. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Second little insight that will help us to choose the best and not just the good is we need to build intentional guardrails. Go to that, you didn't go to that next slide. I was saying all that, and they missed all that. Keep going. Keep going. One more time. There you that, Now, okay, now, now you caught up with me. Okay, here we go. Number three, not only do I choose the best and not just the good, when I listen carefully, when I put intentional guardrails around those non-negotiable areas in my life, are you hearing what I'm saying? You need at least one day where you rest, y'all. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you're working seven days a week, you in sin. Let me just say it like that. Even God rested one day. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But thirdly, I can learn how to choose the best instead of just the good. When I place more value on the, not on the temporal but on the eternal, I know that I'm choosing the good and not the best when I place more value on, on the temporal than the eternal. Look at the text. Look at the text. It says this. <clears throat> but only one thing is necessary for Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. Now, I know we have bought into the lie of the American dream. Y'all know what that lie is, right? Don't act like, come on now. I'm almost finished. I, 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 I got seven more minutes. See, I got a timer on that thing. Y'all didn't know that, did you? <laughs> Let me say it again. You know we have bought into the American dream, don't you? That's why when we look at Glamour magazine and when we look at this on TV, we say, oh, I wish I had, oh, I wish I had. Y'all don't say that. Y'all lying, I say it. Yeah, I'll just say, oh, y'all lying. Y'all lying. But those shiny things that we give our heart to are not going to be able to go with you in that grave. Did you know that? Those shiny things that we are huffing and puffing about are not going to be able to go with you in that grave. Did you hear what I said? Whether you know the Greek language or not, ain't none of y'all seen a Mercedes in a casket with that person. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Don't get it twisted. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The only thing that's going to be in that casket is a body, not even your spirit, 
And depending on whether or not you love Jesus and turn to him, that spirit's going to be in one or two places. Do I have to explain that? I have decided that I want to live for the eternal and not the temporal. One of my favorite songs is the song that was written 180 years ago. It's an old song. See, this is not a Baptist church. I grew up in a Baptist church. So we don't do a lot of Baptist stuff here. But If it was, if it was a Baptist church, I have a robe on, I'd be swaying right now. <laughs> well, oh, okay. Yeah, George, why don't these folks know what's going on around it? <laughs> but a song by Edward Moat, written about 180 years ago, says this. My hope is built on nothing less. Than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. I don't know about you, my friend. I don't know about you, my friend. I don't know about you, my friend. But when that job that I thought I'd have for 20 years is gone in two months, when those friends who said they were going to be my friends, no matter what, are now my enemies, When that money that I thought I had in that account truly has become funny. You remember we said, oh, this, your money funny. <laughs> when maybe my spouse has betrayed me. She said she'd love me forever and now she's in the arms of another man. He said he'd love me forever and now he's in the arms of another woman. When I get that, that diagnosis uh, for cancer, 
Some of you know my testimony. That diagnosis came in 2005 in my life. Came in 2000 or so in my wife's life. We both have had cancer. And you have to ask yourself, what am I really standing on here? You know, it's, it's easy to say you love Jesus when everything is going your way. <laughs> it, it's easy to say you love Jesus when uh, your money is not funny and your friends are really your friends. <laughs> but trust this old guy. There will be a time when the foundation that you thought was sound will not be sound. There will be a time when that spouse betrays you. When that husband betrays you. When that child does something that you could not imagine they're going to do. When that time comes, you're going to need to choose the best, amen? You're going to need to know that the best is not that car, is not that bank account, is not those stock options, is, is not your connections, is not your network, is not your education. The best, help me, Jesus, is that solid rock. Jesus Christ. We're going to move into communion now. Pastor Kevin is going to do that, but he's going to come up right now because I've asked him to do the call and response to this message. So those of you who are our prayer leaders, I'd like you to now get on the walls or wherever you need to be. And then Pastor Kevin is going to lead us in a call and response and in communion. And I'm going to come back, and we're going to say a prayer together at the end. So I don't want you to leave because you'll miss this prayer that I put in your bulletin. Don't leave after communion, which is going to be offering also. So get your offering ready as well as get your heart ready for communion. But I don't want you to leave. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We're going to get out early now because there's a special prayer that I have put in your bulletin that I want us to say together, okay?